Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with him. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud casts a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. And they were coming down from the mountain. Jesus charged them, Do not tell this vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. In the main chapel of the lower church of the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi, there's a crucifixion scene with an interesting addition to it. There's a man standing there, and this man has two faces, one that's looking right and one that's looking left. And it might seem confusing at first if you don't know what you're looking at. You know, perhaps the artist started, messed up, and tried to fix the person halfway through. Maybe the artist had trouble deciding which way to make the man look, so why not have him look both ways? But if you know a little bit about the pagan beliefs of the Roman Empire, you realize that this person is actually the god Janus. Now, Janus had two faces, one looking to the past and one looking to the future. It's where we get the name January from, because it's a month that sees the end of the old year and the beginning of the new one. And the reason why that Roman god is there is because the artist wanted to tell us something. It's because the symbolism of looking across time applies to the crucifixion of our Lord. For Jesus' sacrifice extends throughout all time. And in a similar way, we can see echoes of his life ripple out from that very moment in time on the cross, both into the future and into the past. It is similar to how you, when you throw a rock into still water, the ripples spread out in all directions. And each ripple contains something of that original disturbance. They have that same intensity and they show the direction of that force going out. And today's gospel shows us just such a ripple, for we see a foreshadowing of what is to come. The transfiguration as one of those ripples serves as a twin of sorts to the execution narrative that we see in the last chapters of Matthew. See the parallels. In the one, a private epiphany, an exalted Jesus with garments glistening, stands on a high mountain and is flanked by two religious giants of the past. All is light. In the other, it's a public spectacle, a humiliated Jesus whose clothes have been torn from him and divided, who is lifted upon a cross and is flanked by two common, convicted criminals. All is darkness. It is like we are looking at a diptych, or a picture with two plates, in which those two plates have similar lines, but they have different colors in them. And it's as if we're looking at two moments from one direction, just like Janus. The parallel scenes highlight the horror of Good Friday and the splendor of Jesus' heavenly glory. It is no ordinary man that will be crucified on Calvary, but the beloved Son of God, who revealed himself in his heavenly glory 
at the transfiguration. The same glorified son will freely submit himself to utter humiliation in order to redeem the human family, in order to redeem us. And in that, we see a love that the world has never been able to match. We see a love that calms every fear. In that, we see a love that is powerful enough to overcome death. It is a love strong enough to endure any suffering like none before it and that would come after it. It is a love that knows the depth of pain yet still chooses to suffer because it wants to see humanity reconciled with God. But wants is not a strong enough word. The love of God longs for humanity to return to him. Christ's love is so powerful that it pervades all time and it will be offered to all. We cannot be separated from that love unless we turn our backs on it, for love is always a free choice. We are not forced to love God. It always remains an invitation to us. And it is a free invitation from the Almighty. We have done nothing to deserve it. Quite the opposite, really. And now we come to the practical purpose of the transfiguration. Christ's transfiguration was meant to strengthen the apostles for when their faith in him would be tested. In that parallel between the transfiguration and the crucifixion, God is showing us the unity of God's glory with his suffering of love that he experienced to redeem us. He is giving us a foretaste of his glory so that we might be strengthened for the trials of today. It came at a time when the news seemed to be closing around Jesus' neck, where his enemies in Jerusalem were gathering followers and they were gaining momentum to their cause to put him to death. And his apostles might have been tempted in this time to start doubting that Jesus was who he was saying he was. But today, as Jesus strengthened the apostles' faith, he wishes to strengthen your faith with his glory. The apostles did not know how the story of Christ would end. But you do. During this, uh, during this crucifixion, the faith of the apostles failed, even after they had seen Jesus open the heavens and show them his true identity as the fulfillment of the law of Moses and the predictions of the prophets. But it does not have to be so with you. Look at the coronavirus. It is a type of story that the media longs for, and it instills fear in all of those who read about it because they want you to keep reading about it. But what have you to fear if Christ is on your side? What do you have to run from if you are in a state of grace? If you receive the sacraments regularly and give all your cares to the Lord in prayer and all your sins to him in confession, why must you worry? If God is with you, who can stand against you? My prayer for all of you this Sunday is that the glory of Christ's transfiguration might bring light to all the dark places in your life, both in the past and be your protection for the future. May its light dispel all your fears, and may it transform you with the power of his love so that you may reach Easter as a new creation, belonging completely to God, and at ease in the loving embrace of his tender care.